All right, let's finish up some moral psychology. So we went through some prompts and some issues with uh, how weird it was to think about how um, how troubling some of these things were. Now let's try to understand what, what's going on. So remember the discussion that we had a while back in behavioral economics about how there was um, roughly two different systems and that they we typically apply to different things, but they could sometimes um, apply to the same phenomena. And you'd come to an intuitive understanding of something very quickly, unconsciously, automatically, um, that kind of thing. And sometimes you wouldn't. And if you force yourself to think quickly about things that are more reasoned, you would come to predictably irrational consequences or results. So, so now let's try to make sense of what happened in the previous section and what's been happening. In the social intuitionist model of behavior, of moral psychology, or at least of, uh, of Jonathan Haidt's moral psychology, there's an eliciting situation and your intuition comes in first. Then you make a judgment and then you make reasoning to justify that, that judgment. You could also use that to um, try to convince other people either by judgment alone or by uh, reasoning. Um, every once in a while, your reasoning affects your judgment. Most often it doesn't. Um, and in a long, like over the long, long uh, arc of time in your life, your reasoning might affect your initial intuitions as well. So <clears throat> if that model is plausible, then you would expect in certain circumstances where you could uh, f create an intuition that um, might change the people's interpretation of what's going on without uh, in any way changing the actual moral salience of the, the prompt. So take, for example, this uh, study, which hypnotized some participants to be bothered by the, tr the word often. And they'd be asked to read these, these prompts out loud and some of the prompts you'd have take, will take bribes from, take, or, and others would be um, often bribed by or often go on, that kind of difference. So have the people would get one prompt and versus the other. All right, Congressman Arnold Paxson frequently gives speeches condemning corruption and arguing for campaign finance reform, but he is just trying to cover up for the fact that he himself will take bribes from or is often bribed by the tobacco lobby to promote their legislation. Two, Bob was at a family gathering where he met Ellen, a second cousin of his that he had never met before. Bob found Ellen very attractive and he asked her out on a date. Ellen accepted and they began to have a romantic and sexual relationship. They take slash often go on weekend trips to romantic hotels in the mountain. You would rate how morally wrong it is and how disgusting it is. And sure enough, when there was hypnotic disgust present, um, the uh, people would rate uh, the morality of these circumstances, in some cases, worse, right? Um, not, uh, is there any of these numbers where it's the reverse? Eating one's dog morally wasn't affected uh, uh, almost at all. And the disgust rating. Um, yeah, I don't see a single one that is, I mean, some of the differences are extremely tiny, but oh, library theft was, uh, he got the reverse result, which you should expect sometimes, right? Once out of at least 20 times. So typically when there was disgust present by changing one word, um, 
it made people think that things were more disgusting and more immoral. And that included neutral cases, right? So Dan is a student council representative at a school. He is in charge of scheduling discussions about academic issues. He tries to take or often picks topics that appeal to both professors and students in order to stimulate discussion. People are like, I don't know. It just seems like he's up to something. He's a popularity seeking snub. I'm not sure what's wrong with it. It just is. It's not a huge difference, right? Like most people still rated it um, this is being uh, normal, but you got quite a few people that rated it as immoral when there was disgust present. So you can see the graphs. It's just more people that are affected by it. And in fact, um, people do this in normal circumstances. If you uh, are in uh, disheveled in a messy area, people will judge you more harshly and will judge normal circumstances more harshly than if you're well put together. Okay, so let's try to put this all together and try to make sense of what's going on. These principles of moral psychology, roughly it's three. Intuition comes first, strategic reasoning is second along the lines of behavioral economics, but now applied to morality. Number two, morality binds and builds. And number three, morality is more than harms and fairness. We'll take these each in turn. So intuition comes first, reasoning comes second. It seems like um, we tend to be more group-ish than selfish. And um, we'll have certain intuitions that uh, that just come first. So in the later slide, I'll make the point that uh, the mind is a lawyer, not a scientist. You form your group first, you form your identity first, you form your, um, your intuitions first, and then the reasoning comes in. And it can be that way for reasons having to do with your culture or your innate values or the what you people that look like you uh, believe to be true. So we were discussing uh, the difference between empiricism and rationalism. You might even add another one. There's an innate natural uh, tendency towards being moral, uh, moral or to have moral emotions. The alternative explanations to where morality comes from might be that we learn them or that we can reconstruct them rationally. The moral psychology view is no, we have certain predispositions towards some, immor some moral categories, but they're not hardwired or fixed. They can be influenced by society. They're part of the fast system though. And, and they work in ways that emotions work or perceptions work. They work very quickly, they're intuitive and they're automatic. And what that means is that um, while reasoning can play a role, it's not a, the central thing. Like there's this thing in politics, you can't reason somebody out of a view that they didn't reason themselves into in the first place. That might be the case for most moral judgments. Number two, morality binds and builds. You can view, understand Morse moral psychology by viewing it as a form of enlightenment, enlightened self-interests. We're not saints, but we're sometimes good team players. We have groupish mechanisms because groups, is, well, I'll ignore that justification, but we're good team players. Um, We like to think that people acting in favor of our group um, can be part of our group or not, but anybody acting against it is against our group. So consider this circumstance. A vice president of the company went to a chairman of the board and said, we, th we are thinking of starting a new program. It will help us increase profits, but it will also harm the environment. The chairman of the board answered, I don't care at all about harming the environment. I just wanna make as much profit as I can. Let's start the new program. They started a new program and sure enough, the environment was harmed. 
In the harm case, four out of five people think that the chairman was intentional. He was being immoral. But if you replace the word harm in that prompt with help, I don't care about helping the environment. All I care about is profit. Most people don't think that the chairman intended to help the environment or that he should be praised for that side effect. So side effects only matter when they're negative. Um, okay. So we think about groups, we think about situations, we think emotionally um, when it comes to moral reasoning. Um, you might start to wonder, how do we think about each other? And in particular, how ought to we think about um, lots of things? So right now we are in a pandemic that is killing uh, about as many people as died in 9-11 every couple of days. Um, when it killed one person, it was a big deal. It seemed like that story was everywhere. And now it seems like people don't care. So, you could imagine a situation where the more people die of something, the more we care. We could imagine a situation where a few people dying doesn't bother us, but the, as it gets, as more and more people die, it does affect us. Or we really care for one person, we stop caring at all about more people. Or we care a little about one people, and we, one person, we care a little more when it comes to other people. Sadly, I think. All of the evidence is whether we should or not, what we end up doing is not caring about groups of people, large, large group, groups of people. So imagine you're given this prompt, you're set, you're, uh, somebody approaches you with a clipboard and they say, Rokia, a seven-year-old girl from Mali, Africa is desperately poor and faces a threat of severe hunger or even starvation. Her life will be changed for the better as a result of your financial gift. With your support and the support of other caring sponsors, Save the Children will work with Rokia's family and other members of the community to help feed her, provide her with education, as well as basic medical care and hygiene education. Another person approaches you at a different time and says, food shortages in Malawi are affecting more than 3 million children. In Zambia, severe rainfall deficits have resulted in a 42% drop in maize production from 2000. As a result, an estimated 3 million Zambians face hunger. 4 million Angolans, one third of the population, have been forced to flee their homes. More than 11 million people in Ethiopia need immediate food assistance. You can actually measure how much people donate depending on these circumstances. And it turns out the more people you identify, the more statistics you give, the worse, the less people care. We care about stories, we care about people. We don't care about numbers and we don't care about lots of people. Well, the thing that's crazy to me is that yes, okay, statistics don't paint a story and so people don't donate. But if you tell a, a really detailed story and then you add statistics, it actually decreases the potential um, gift that people will give you. If I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at one, I will. Sometimes knowing too much actually makes it hard for people to care. All right, so morality is a binding thing and it, it forms, it's about groups and for groups, according to moral psychology. But um, Jonathan Haidt wants to push, and this ties into his later work, that morality is more than harm and fairness. It's rich, complex, multifaceted. Um, and then he makes up some stuff about how we how other views think about morality. 
But really the big lesson here is it's not just about benefiting or rhymes or justice. It's not just about um, benefits or consequences. Sometimes we've we come to a conclusion and we spend time trying to justify it. And that's what morality is. It's a lawyer, not a scientist. And so the idea is um, when you're thinking about these thinking fast and thinking slow systems, these automatic versus reasoned systems, you have to think about the automatic system as much, much, much bigger and stronger than the, the reasoned system. You are guided along on the view that eating your family pet is morally problematic. Um, and you, it's hard to come to a different conclusion than that. You just think that it's bad. You can give, give all the reasons in the world and it won't affect you. It's the idea of moral dumbfounding. We have strong feelings and we'll come up with justifications, but if even if you take away those justifications, we still have those feelings. What that means, if moral psychology is correct, then persuasion is only possible among people that you view as your in-group or about things that you don't care about, or if you tell a story. People will ignore facts and figures and arguments. So if you think about a person riding an elephant, the elephant rider, the, the elephant being the, um, the intuition, the automatic uh, procedures. There's many ways that you can change your behavior if you think about your behavior this way. And this is more general than morality. This is going to um, be relevant to all forms of reasoning, all forms of thinking. Either you give yourself direction, very clear. You say, this is what I'm going to do today. You make a checklist. That's what you do. You motivate the, the, the buzz, the elephant. Um, you try to find some bodily reason to desire vegetables rather than... Um, than candy, some real reason to be bothered by um, someone else's emotional distress, someone else, some real reason to be bothered by global injustice or something. Or you shape the road, right? You just make it so that it's, there's no candy in your house. It would take you so much more effort to go out of your way to to satisfy your automatic desires than to do the things that um, you need to do. So that's moral psychology. I really like moral psychology. I've been thinking about it for decades. Um, I think it's like one of those interesting approaches. I mean, there might be problems with it, but overall, I think there's there's a lot of insight we can get from combining behavioral economics insights with morality or with other things that philosophers have cared about for a long time. All right, that's it.